Coming up on this week's show, the Sega Dreamcast turns 20, but how did it influence modern consoles? A stunning new beat-em-up is revealed for the Amiga. And we talk to the man behind Bleem, the legendary PlayStation emulator. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 190, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And all the Sega fanboys are like, where's Joe? He's not here for a second week. Thing is, he's that much of a Sega fanboy. He had to take a week off and celebrate the Dreamcast 20th anniversary. Oh, yes. <laughs> and what a guest we have on the show for the Dreamcast 20th anniversary. We have Randy Linden. Now, Randy is a guy who achieves the impossible. Basically, he's always looked at projects and kind of wanted to achieve the impossible. He started off by doing Dragon's Lair on the Amiga. So right. it was the first kind of video streaming off floppy disk, which, if you think about that, is absolutely crazy. Because that was a Laserdisc game in the arcade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'd hired a Laserdisc player and ripped it and everything. And then he went on to create Bleem. Now, Bleem was a crazy emulator for the PlayStation that could work on a PC, used hardware acceleration but then it also came out on the dreamcast and that really 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 annoyed sony <laughs> <laughs> because you could basically play all the playstation games on your dreamcast in better quality for me that was really interesting because it was the first time in memory i remember i mean it was a playstation emulator a system emulator that you could buy in the shops but i'd never seen anything like that before that it emulated current generation hardware yeah you know it'd be like now getting like a, a playstation 4 emulator for your xbox one wouldn't it but also the court case that happened after this that randy's going to talk about sets the precedent for emulator law in the future yeah so we've got some really interesting conversations on this one and there's some brilliant videos on youtube i think you know lgr did a really good one about bleem a few years ago yeah. in his kind of oddware or tech tales kind of series so it is a fascinating story well, well without randy you know, he discovered the mill CD thing. Basically, there wouldn't be a homebrew scene on the Dreamcast now. Or a piracy scene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to talk to him about that. Randy Lydon is our guest on the Retro Hour podcast. He'll be on in around 15 minutes' time. And if you are missing Joe, he's back next week. Now, talking about the Sega Dreamcast, I mean, it has been everywhere in the news this week. I've seen it, like, you know, on the BBC they were covering. It's been in the Metro. We do need to talk about that system that turned 20 years old. And there's a really interesting article in Engadget we'll talk about in a moment about how the Dreamcast predicted everything about modern consoles. So we'll have a little celebration for the Dreamcast 20th anniversary in the next few minutes. Before we get into that, though, and the rest of this week's stories, just a little reminder that the Retro Hour podcast does come out every single Friday. Every Friday, we bring you the latest in retro gaming news. We bring you a special guest every episode. And we've been doing this show for almost four years now. And of course, we release it completely free every week for you. But the only way that we can keep doing this is thanks to your help. Now, if you want to see the show continue into 2020 and we want to keep putting it out for free, we'd love it if you could just make a little donation into the running of the podcast and help us out with the running costs of it. 100% of it all goes back into the running of the show and really does make a massive difference in terms of keeping this podcast coming out every single week and for making a donation of any amount you will find your place in the very prestigious high score table the retro hour hall of fame like this week sean allen raymond verd Michael Buckland. And Daniel Gregory, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, we accept them via PayPal on our website at theretrohour.com. Click on the supporters tab in the menu, or you can do it direct, PayPal at theretrohour.com. Now, one system that never ceases to amaze us is the Amstrad CPC. <laughs> Yeah, so the Amstrad, we've seen a lot of developments and a lot of people are kind of pushing it beyond how the Amstrad initially was. And Oh my God, there's a fantastic demo that's just come out. And this is the packet. Now, this is point and click engine tool. The spelling click with a K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it does kind of work. Uh, but this is essentially an engine that lets them do point and click adventure games on the Amstrad CPC. Yeah, so they've created a small little demo at the moment. It's not got any savable options. It's not got any sound or anything like that. But this is just a kind of proof of concept yeah. but um they've actually got it kind of working and it looks like one of your really early point and click adventures but uh, really shrunk down but i guess this engine's going to be able to be converted 
and you can create adventures then. You know, there may be some Alan Sugar based uh, point and click games now. <laughs> There's an the, idea. The Apprentice, yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to make a point and click version of that for the Amstrad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is really impressive how they've done it here now. It kind of reminds me a bit, like you said, it's kind of those early scum games it reminds me of a little bit. So you've got the little section at the bottom with them. Um, it's actually icons, not text. So you've got like, you know, a finger pointing upwards for walk forwards. Yeah, yeah, but then it actually does the text at the top. So it's highlighting stuff you know yeah and you've got your little character there looks very much like monkey island or something like that um walking around you get your multiple text options at the top where you can choose what you want to say at the moment this demo has got no music or sound effects and like you said no saving or anything in there but as a proof of concept and how well it's working at the moment this does look like it's got a lot of possibilities yeah and it, it looks like it's quite fast as well yeah really like, fast. Actually. you know i used to play point and click games and you click one side of the screen and it'd take 10 minutes for <laughs> <laughs> simon the sorcerer or whatever to walk across you know and i'm reading here from the developers are saying that you know at the moment the demo is only on the cpc but apparently this is quite cool the compiler is going to be able to generate games for both the cpc and the MSX as well. Oh, that's cool. So so you'll be able to cross-compile coming out of there. Yeah, so we've got no estimated release date as yet, but we'll keep an eye on that if you want to check out this. Um, there's a really cool thread all about it on the uh, cpcwiki.eu website as well. I'll link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, it does seem like in the last 25 years of video games, never a month goes by when something related to Doom isn't making the headlines. Oh, totally. And they've basically demade the latest Doom 4, to this now vanilla mod. And it looks absolutely fantastic. What they've done is they've put the new weapons in there, they've put the new maps, they've introduced new enemies, but they've kept it in that original old-school Doom style. You know these kind of old-school FPS kind of games, especially with Iron Fury, which I've been playing actually yeah. since we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I, I'm really into this kind of old-school FPS kind of look actually again now. So is this, this is Doom 4, the one that came out, the Doom 2016 game then, is it? Yeah. Not the, not the brand new one that's not out yet, I don't think, is it? I did play that one actually on the Xbox and the Nintendo Switch. So what they've actually done is, they've kind of demade this end for the original Doom engine. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. And, and the cool thing is, I'm thinking you're probably going to be able to, if this is just a wad or something, um, you may be able to actually chuck it on like Amiga or on any other system that plays Doom. Apparently it works with any Doom source port, it says. Um, the graphics on it, though, do look a hell of a lot better than the original. I mean, it is kind of that, you know, same kind of pixel style. Yeah, it's still really chunky, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't know if it's just my memory, but it looks a lot smoother than the original Doom did. That is very cool, though, that they've managed to do this. And it does kind of make you think, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if, like, you know, when you've got, like, new versions of games that are kind of follow-ups to the old ones, they kind of do updated versions of the classics, too? So I was watching a video the other day. Do you watch um, Gaming Historian? Uh, I've seen a bit of it. Yeah, yeah, on YouTube, really good channel. And he did a comparison of every single Doom game that came out on every console. It's like, you know, an hour-long video, and it compares every little element, what's in each one. And it was such a good watch as well. But it actually took until the Xbox 360 and the PS3 to really get a perfect version of Doom on a console. Well, interestingly, Randy... Yeah. Our guest has actually ported Doom to the SNES. So he did the SNES port. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was one. I mean, that was a really good port of it. That was so impressive that that could happen. And, and that it system. had the full map on there as well, actually. So, I mean, you think then Doom really, it didn't come out in the Mega Drive, only the 32X, didn't it? Yeah. So you needed the 32X on the, on the Mega Drive to run Doom. And then it was on like the Jaguar and 3DO. 3DO. Yeah. yeah. I mean, less said about that port, the better. <laughs> but the fact the SNES could run it, you know, on 16 bit hardware, that was like a, a marvel in itself, really. So uh, definitely got to ask Randy about how he managed that on the Super Nintendo as well when he's on the show in the next few minutes. Now, we did mention at the start of this week's show that this week we did see a rather big anniversary for one of our all-time favourite systems and a system that today does actually get quite a lot of love. On Monday, the Dreamcast celebrated its 20th anniversary. Well, technically, only in America because it did come out on the 9th of September 1999 in America, but we didn't get it here in the UK until um, October 99, I think. Yeah, and I didn't <laughs> know many people with them, but the people that I did know, I was amazed by it. I thought it was such a good system. Um, so revolutionary with like the controls, the, the VMU, do you remember that little screen that you put inside your controller? Yeah, talk, oh, talking about battery munchers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was cool. I mean, essentially it did like, it changed memory cards and made them fun. 
by you know not only having little screens on there and you could even have little games that worked on the VMU, couldn't you? Yeah, it was a it was a really good kind of final shout for Sega, and I wish it had been more successful, but you know having the DVD ROM in the uh, PlayStation 2. I think that's what got it with their strange GD ROMs, but we'll be talking about that with Randy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was probably the final nail in the coffin when the PlayStation 2 came along. But, I mean, you are right there. It was a very revolutionary system. And, you know, really, I remember it kind of being hyped up as, like, you know, the, the Sega Naomi arcade hardware, an arcade machine in your home. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, it, it kind of was. I mean, some games are actually better on the um, the Dreamcast than they were on the Naomi hardware. Now, there's actually a really good article here. Of course, there's been a lot of mainstream press. I actually probably have seen more mainstream press celebrating the Dreamcast in the last week than I did this week in 1999, <laughs> unfortunately for Sega. But there is a really nice article here on Engadget talking about how the Dreamcast kind of heralded in and predicted everything about modern consoles and the fact that it's had a really lasting legacy. Now, they're talking stuff about the, the hardware and the software. You remember back then, the GPU that was used in the Dreamcast was DirectX compatible. Yeah. And obviously, a lot of the games in there that could work with, um, there was Microsoft got involved in it as well, and they had Windows CE that was on there too. And we did episodes in the past all about that, if you want to check those out in our show history. But they're talking today that you look at modern consoles, and now this kind of commodity PC hardware and graphics chips and all that have made their way into home systems. So this really was the first time that a, a home console and a PC was kind, kind of became closer together architecturally. Yeah, it was kind of like the precursor to the Xbox, yeah. really. Absolutely, yeah. And they're talking about, in this article as well, that, you know, essentially the original Xbox was a Pentium 3-based PC, wasn't it? Yeah. And Microsoft were involved with the Dreamcast as well. And even look at the controller on there as well, the layout of the buttons and everything that, of course, did go into the Xbox after that too. And even today, you can see that legacy in the Xbox One and stuff like the Switch Pro controller. So that button layout that they did on that controller that I know was a bit hit and miss for a lot of people. The analog stick placement wasn't all that good in hindsight, but they were doing something brand new. And it really did have a lasting legacy. And the fact it had built-in networking too. Yeah, yeah. It just had everything going against it at the time. You know, yeah. I thought the hardware was incredible and great, but to be honest, when my friend got a Dreamcast on the first like couple of weeks of European release, he had a boot disc there that was yep. already prepared. He had all the games. I think he bought one original game. That was it. <laughs> like, <laughs> Token <you> know, gesture. <laughs> straight away, yeah. But it was that small, tiny period between the PlayStation, wasn't it? And they had about six months just to try and make a dent, and they couldn't. It's, it was sad to see. And it did sell well, you know, in that first initial six months before yeah. the PlayStation 2 came out and then just completely wiped the floor with it. But you have to remember how incredible playing stuff like Fantasy Star Online was. On a Dreamcast, like, you know, in 1999, 2000. Oh, yeah, but also some of the titles that they had. So Jet Set Radio, if you remember that, that was an absolute fantastic one. Some of the arcade games they had, um, what was the uh, Seaman and yeah. um, uh, <laughs> Choo Choo Rocket. And, you know, there was, there was loads of kind of experimental games as well. Yeah, and Quake 3, that was a great port on there. I, I think the online. one thing that let it down was the sports. And it was like all the extra sports people had kind of gone off to the PlayStation and, yeah. and it was stuck to Sega Sports and that really didn't uh, kind of, you know, work. Yeah, it didn't quite compare to EA's titles yeah, and stuff, exactly. did it? It wasn't FIFA. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing. It's It was a great system, but it really did get damaged by what Sega did with the Saturn and the 32X yeah. before it too. But I also love the fact that, you know, you could get a mouse and a keyboard for it as well, talking about that oh, kind of... Oh, and you could get yeah. a variety of guns as well. It was fantastic. Well, they're also talking... Uh, here. Maracas, do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I still got my maracas at home and my bongos too. Yeah. Um, they're also saying here that essentially, this has got an interesting thing, Theory, that the Dreamcast was basically the Xbox 0 0.5. And they're talking about when the, the Xbox 360 came along. There was a lot of similarities. There's actually an article here from 2005 on OneUp um, talking about why the Xbox 360 is the second coming of the Sega Dreamcast. They're talking about here, not only did it also have that kind of matching colour scheme, you remember the original 360s with that kind of cream colour, weren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. And they also had kind of swirly logos that were quite similar to... Yeah, yeah, the Xbox arcade versions that they bought out. Yeah, I remember those. And they did seem pretty dreamcast -y, yeah. Yeah, and they're talking about how both consoles made their debut on MTV in America. They both ran on a uh, Windows-derived operating system. They all both had online play built in, Saganet and then Xbox Live came along after it too. 
Um, they're also talking here, I didn't know this, that a guy called Peter Moore, he was the uh, guy behind the marketing of both the Dreamcast and the Xbox 360 later on as well. So a lot of the same people were kind of involved in both yeah, of these Yeah, we had systems. Ed Fries as well that was yeah. kind of crossover who we interviewed. And they're also talking about, you know, stuff like um, having a microphone peripheral that you could obviously get for the, the Dreamcast when you plugged it into yeah, the, uh, yeah. the controller. So talk to the fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a lot of similarities when you look at it. And I think it is really true. It, it is kind of tragic that in its day, the Dreamcast didn't get as much love as it deserved. Do you remember Sega Bass Fishing as well with the little <laughs> fishing reel? I bought reel. those when we were at like a, a play expo or something, didn't I, a few yeah. years ago. I've only used it once, but yeah, it was a load of fun. So, I mean, I think today, it's weird though, because the amount of people that we talk to, and they're always like, oh yeah, the Dreamcast is my favourite system ever. Yeah. But it's like, you know, if only people thought that 20 years ago, it might have sold a bit better. But <laughs> it did have a lasting legacy. So, happy 20th birthday, Sega Dreamcast. And you know, you mentioned actually Choo Choo Rocket just then which I thought I'd just quickly mention, is actually getting a sequel. Oh, cool. That's going to be coming out um, only on phones, on Android and uh, Apple Arcade, but it does look pretty good, actually. So you want to find out more about that, um, I'll show you in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat with Randy Linden, talking about the PlayStation emulator for PC and Dreamcast, Bleem, and also talking about porting the impossible Doom to the Super Nintendo, Dragon's Lair to the Amiga. He's coming up on the show in just a minute. Before we get into that, actually, speaking of the Amiga, just want to talk about this incredible new game. Now, one of my favourite genres back in the day, it had to be those kind of side-scrolling brawler games. You know, like, obviously, Streets of Rage and Final Fight. Oh, that was yeah. another great game. Never really been replicated all that successfully on the Amiga, those kind no, of games. No, um, what was it was a famous kind of Mortal Kombat where you had to put the disc in for the finishing moves. And, um, yeah, it, it didn't really translate well in Amiga. And Amiga tried to do their own titles, so Body Blows yeah. was one of the series. Um, I remember the best one was probably Elf Mania. Yeah. But um, the theme was really weird. Elves fighting <laughs> and <laughs> trolls. It was a very strange I think that game. did put a lot of people off that game. Yeah. yeah. Look. But, I mean, this kind of genre, taken away from just the two people kind of one-on-one, I'm, I'm more talking about the games that were scrolling games where you go along and you brawl as you go. Okay, so like, yeah, those kind of streets, streets of rage. rage. Yeah, yeah, okay, I well, see what you well, mean. Well, there is a new one here that's um, it's got a great little trailer at the moment. This is called Metro Siege, and it's by Pixel Glass, who were the team behind that really good Amiga game recently, Worthy. Yeah. So... If Saying didn't... that, sorry, Double Dragon was awful on the Amiga. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, Double Dragon Three, I actually didn't mind all that much. But okay, yeah, yeah. I, I know it, it doesn't have many fans apart from me. <laughs> uh, but I mean, check out this trailer that I'll link up in our show notes as well. Metro Siege. Now, this does look like it's obviously very heavily influenced by games like Final Fight. Um, but if you look at it, how smooth does that look for the Amiga Five Hundred? For the 500, this looks fantastic, and yeah. the uh, scrolling looks really nice as well. And it's like they've not spent too long on parallax and stuff, but they've made the effects look really good, and the artwork's pretty fantastic. Yeah, so if you love stuff like Streets of Rage, it's very similar. Even the font looks like Streets of Rage, actually, the font yeah. that they did. D- did you see this Amiga first-person shooter that was released earlier? They, oh, they, yeah. They put I, yeah. video out of a 500 and people uh, version of it running on a 500, and people were like, no, that's a lie! And then there was a huge <laughs> battle over it, because, you know, some of these games, when they were released back in the days, if these had come out, they would have been... Oh God, yeah. Top hit sellers, you know, they would have sold millions. Well, one good thing that they've done with this game here is, I mean, it's optimized for a one megabyte Amiga 500. The fact that it runs as smoothly as it does on that kind of stock system is mm. testament to how good these guys are at coding these systems. But also, it's going to have foreground and background parallax, over 60 colors on screen. It's going to have one thing that was always missing from Amiga games back in the day, multi-button joypad support. Oh, yes. that It was always two buttons, wasn't it? Even though you'd have a beautiful game. It was up to jump and fire to hit. That was about <laughs> it, really, wasn't it? Or, or it was combinations of them. If you want to punch, it's like down, diagonal, and fire. It was <laughs> like... So having joypad support, because I think pretty much everyone I know that plays the Amiga these days either uses stuff like a Mega Drive pad or a, a CD32 controller on them. It's going to have two-player co-op as well. Oh, nice. You know, which is like Streets of Rage. We should do a, a co-op long play, Dan. I'm interested because, you know, Joe loves Streets of Rage. When he's back next week, I'm going to yeah. show him this. And uh, you maybe get him on this, you know, a real Streets of Rage connoisseur, see what he makes of this. Um, no release date for it yet. I did read in a few forums, hoping to get it out before Christmas. And looking at their other games, I mean, I imagine it'll probably be like Worthy, where these are commercial games they put out for the Amiga, but they release like a digital download for about nine, ten euros. Yeah, and they also have boxed versions yeah. as well as stuff, so that could be nicely presented. Yeah, I mean, Worthy was really well done. I think that was like 25 euros to get like a, a CD-ROM and uh, 
you know, for the CD32 and a disc inside a nice box and a manual. So, I mean, hopefully this will be in our Christmas stocking. Also, if this is 500, I guess it's going to easily work on the CD32 as well. A breeze. I mean, there's been some talk in forums about whether they're going to do kind of an AGA enhanced version, which they might do with more colours and stuff. So, but I think seeing that run on the 500, like you said, if that had come out like back in the early 90s, I don't think my no one I know would have bought a Mega Drive instead, you know, to play Streets of Rage. Yeah, stuff, you so. would have just been like, right, come round here, look yeah. at this. <laughs> <laughs> so Metro Siege is what it's called, so I'll stick that trailer That's awesome. in our show notes and everything else we've talked about this week at theretrohour.com. And right now, time to get into this week's special guest, a man that has done so much. And like Ravi said at the start of the show, kind of achieved the impossible, getting Dragon's Lair running on the Amiga that was originally a Laserdisc game, getting Doom to run on the Super Nintendo when the Sega Genesis couldn't handle it without a 32X, and also the man that allowed us to play PlayStation games on our PC and our Sega Dreamcast. This week's special guest is Randy Linden. You're listening to the Retro Owl Podcast, and it is our pleasure to welcome on this week's very special guest. We're talking before about the 20th anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast, which is crazy that it's been two decades. And we're going to talk about a really innovative product. I mean, Bleem, one of the most incredible emulation products ever. But also going back to stuff like Dragon's Lair and Doom on the Super Nintendo, let's welcome on this week's very special guest, Randy Linden. Welcome to the Retro Hour. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. 20 years of the Dreamcast, so we were just talking a moment ago that that's insane, isn't it? It's it's amazing. I am a big fan of the Dreamcast. I, I, I think it's unfortunate that it didn't receive the same commercial success because the machinery uh, itself is so powerful that uh, I don't think that its lifespan um, was long enough for developers to really start pushing the envelope. Um, I mean, there were... There were always innovative titles, um, a couple of them that that you didn't see on any other platform, mm. but uh, it didn't it didn't have the longevity, unfortunately, that uh, I think it really deserved. Well, before we get into the things that you've been developing over the last uh, you know three decades or so, um, yeah. let's get into your like early days of computing and gaming. I mean, do you remember like your kind of earliest memory of gaming? My f- first experience with gaming was actually at a, at a, they don't have them anymore, an actual arcade. It was wow. a, across the street from the junior high school that I was attending. And it was in a little strip mall and you go downstairs into this dark dungeon-like uh, room. There were two rooms and it had, you know, Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and Space Invaders and Centipede, um, the sort of like the very first generation of, of arcade stand-up machines where you literally put a, a single quarter into the machine. Um, and that was sort of the very first experience on arcade level. At home, had a TI-99 slash 4A, and it was one of the first home computers, and uh, it had a handful of games, and, and one of my favorites was called Parsec. And then, of course, the Commodore 64, which had just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of high quality games i think the commodore 64 was the real first big uh, step forward uh, as far as a mass market computer slash game uh system well you started coding on a commodore pet how did you kind of get access to that machine and how did you start learning to code it's actually a good question and kind of funny um the same junior high that that i was at had a room with three Commodore PET. I want to say they were 2001. So it was a PET, Personal Electronic Transactor, 2001. It had a, a green monitor. It, it was sort of like all you know, built together. The monitor wasn't separate. And they had three of these things in there. And one day, somebody came in with a tape uh, cassette, because that's how the storage worked on on the machine back then. It was all regular audio tape cassettes, and there was a version of Space Invaders written by Jim Butterfield, and the name always stuck because he, it turns out, lived in Toronto, and a couple of nights, here I am at 12 or 13 years old, 
calling, uh, just cold calling this guy, Jim Butterfield, and asking him programming questions. No way. <laughs> yes, and he actually responded. He was very, very kind. And I started looking into Space Invaders, and I discovered the Commodore PET had a built-in machine language monitor where you could, you know, look at memory and look at the programs. And I, I really didn't know very much at the time. And so I said, okay, well, let's print out to the printer this memory, which is the game of Space Invaders, so I could study it. And of course, it was just um, not like a disassembly or a source code or anything like that. It was just all the actual characters, so things like line feeds. And so it was like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of just gobbledygook because it was sort of like, um, what if you take a Word file and you don't use Word, you just you know, literally send the file to the printer. It's just all sorts of control characters and garbage. And, and, but that's how I got my start. Um, I started off uh, with the Commodore PET, uh, got hooked. And uh, as soon as the uh, Commodore 64 came out, my mom uh, got me one. And uh, that sort of launched my career. So how much did it change your life then getting the 64? Oh, it was, it was amazing. The ability to have a home computer and, you know, it was basically just the size of the keyboard, uh, but, you know, maybe twice or three times the thicker, allowed me to program and play around. I ended up writing a game called Bubbles, which was basically a, a clone of Centipede, but underwater. And back then, there, there were no... Uh, C compilers, there weren't even assemblers if you wanted to write assembly code. So you had to know all the machine language instructions. And I still to this day know, like, for example, uh, hex 60 is return from subroutine and hex 20 is jump to subroutine and, <laughs> and all of these 6502 opcodes that you had to hand enter when you're programming. Um, so I, I wrote a, a centipede clone, and there was a company based out of Toronto, Canada, again, that's where I grew up, called Syntax Software. And uh, I went, uh, it was five minutes from school, because I was still in high school at the time, and rang the, the doorbell and uh, said, hi, I'm a big fan, and I've got a program and maybe you'd be interested in taking a look at it. And the guy's name was Randy Lyons. L-Y-O-N-S was his last name. And, it, and as soon as I saw that, it's like, okay, well, this is, this means the stars are aligning here because <laughs> he's got the same first name as me. And uh, that uh, was where the, um, my very first program was published through Syntax Software when I was uh, 13 years old, so that's now about uh, three and a half decades, 37-ish years, long time ago. I was thrilled, and I was actually also what they called a Commodore kid, and I don't know, I don't remember how they got my name, but effectively what Commodore did to market the Commodore 64 was they sent out a fleet of I want to say young people, like I said, 12, 13 at the time, uh, dressed in a suit with a Commodore logo on the, on the, you know, the pocket on the outside. And we worked at department stores that were featuring the Commodore 64. And I still remember the slogan of I adore my 64. And so I was a Commodore kid at a department store for a while. I'm, selling, I'm really uh, jealous. I want to be a Commodore kid. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I, I don't even know what happened to the blazer, but we got, like I said, it, in retrospect, it, it probably was a little bit funny, but I guess they, their marketing worked because the Commodore 64 became immensely popular. You know, there were thousands of, of programs available for it, and uh, it was a great um, experience to sort of show people, they had uh, a bunch of demos Commodore had put together. It was around Christmas time, and the graphics and sound and music coming out of this little tiny box, and they had a special where if you bought the computer, 
Uh, you also got the 1702, I think was its model number, the 1702 monitor and a desk, a computer desk to put all of this stuff on. And uh, yeah, the Commodore 64 really launched my career. So you founded Visionary Design Technologies in your mum's basement. What were the kind of aims of this company then? Well, the, actually, the name was picked because the initials were VDT for Video Display Terminal. And I just wanted some name that sort of matched that. Um, we were a game company, a handful of us working out of, out of mom's basement. We launched two titles. Uh, one of them was called Data Storm. Uh, sort of uh, think of that as uh, Defender on steroids. Uh, and the second one, and that was written by Soren Grombeck, a Danish guy, also brilliant programmer who went to write uh, Sword of Sodan on the uh, Amiga. And uh, the second title was called Vortex. And that uh, was done by another excellent programmer named Andy or Anselm Hook. But... Uh, you know, very, very young, just starting a company. And I remember one day somebody calling, and it was from a, a store chain, and they wanted to return, you know, a certain number of units. And uh, I was sort of playing it by ear because we didn't really have a system for tracking uh, returns and shipments. And they wanted an RMA number, a return merchandise authorization uh, which is standard for all the big software companies so that, you know, you can swap stock and whatever. I just made up a number and said, oh, your RMA number is, you know, G62594. And, <laughs> and of course, then later on in, in the month, we received a, a handful of, of uh, the data storm and vortex with that particular return merchandise authorization number. Um, but we really were just uh, a handful of guys um, trying uh, to uh, launch a game company because we all loved the machines and uh, loved uh, gaming. Well, when the Amiga came along, that you know it seemed like a, a supercomputer. Like you know, I'd never seen anything like it. But the one thing is, it couldn't play Commodore sixty four games. Of course, you did remedy that with uh, the sixty four emulator that you made with uh, David Foster from Digital Leisure. So. How did that go down then, doing an emulator for the 64 on the Amiga? It was it was actually um, a lot more complex than it appeared at first. The the 64 emulator it was very well received um, because it made it possible for people to sort of upgrade from the 64 to the Amiga. Um, we also designed and and manufactured literally by hand. Uh, a little interface that plugged into the parallel port on the Amiga, and on the other end was the standard circular connector that lets you plug in one of the Commodore 64's 1541 or 1571 or 1581 disk drives. So you could literally connect your Commodore 64 disk drive to the Amiga, put in a Commodore 64 floppy disk, boot the emulator on the Amiga, and then load that program. We were at a trade show once uh, showing off the 64 emulator, and it turns out that the president of Commodore at the time, I think it was Irving Gould, but it might have still been uh, Jack Tramiel, was sort of touring the trade show because it was just, it was uh, uh, Commodore 64 and Amiga trade show only. And I want to say it was something like, Commodore World or something like that. And the president stopped by our booth and was very impressed. And he turned around to the crowd and he said about the 64 emulator, this is exactly the kind of software that we need. We want more of this kind of software. And it was, it was uh, quite a, a kudos to hear that, that we were on the right track. But it was, uh, it was a lot of work. But it was great, and it sort of made the transition from Commodore 64 to Amiga, as well as backwards, easier for me. Because at that time, the database program that I wrote, the paperback fi uh, filer, which became Pocket Filer, was still being sold by Digital Solutions. And there was a bug that was discovered in it. And uh, the program was so complex that what I ended up doing was using 
the 64 emulator to emulate the Commodore 64 so I could debug the paperback filer that I had written for the Commodore 64 <laughs> because I could do so with such ease. So it was actually a really great way of getting, you know, real down deep at the lowest levels of, of both machines. It was, it was a, it was a great time. Do you remember the first time you experienced Dragon's Lair and why was this title so amazing and unique back then? I do. Um, it was in the same arcade uh, across from the junior high and it, it was one of the machines that had like a huge long lineup and and uh, it's sort of like a pool table where you you know you put down your money because you want to play next. Well, you would see people that had stacked up you know a dozen quarters or whatever to play this new game. And the big difference was the quality of the graphics. Um, and of course, we all know now that it it was not so much graphics as it was. Uh, cell animation where they had you know a fleet of people uh, literally drawing and animating like Sunday morning cartoons um, and it ran off of a laser disc which because this was so early on before you know the typical PCs and and what have you didn't really have CD-ROM drives even the laser disc player is uh, imagine if you will an old vinyl record about twice as thick, all silver colored. Um, that's sort of a laser disc. And the player, of course, was even bigger uh, to play it. Um, but it was neat. And people would stand around and watch whoever was playing as they worked their way through all the different levels because uh, there wasn't a lot of interactivity per se. You just sort of had to know what direction to move the joystick or to hit the use the sword button at the right time. But there was a handful of people who could, with the one quarter, play all the way through from the beginning to the end of the game. Um, and it piqued my curiosity and I thought, gee, this, could, this is something that would be great, you know, if there was a home computer version. Well, well you uh, kind of did that, didn't you? You did the impossible by taking this laser disc game that you mentioned then, needed all that expensive kit and you ported that to the Commodore Amiga on a floppy disk. How, how did you manage that? I actually went downtown to a couple of the arcades one day and the arcades that had Dragon's Lair asked how to get a hold of the Laserdisc and eventually found some someone who would sell me the Laserdisc. I still have the original Laserdiscs and then I rented from a store a Laserdisc player and worked with a uh, company called Sunrise Industries. Uh, they had just released a digitizer, so it would take you know composite input for you know video or whatever, and it scanned and generated. Here's you know a still image on your computer. Um, as a, a side note, Sunrise Industries was the brainchild of Anthony Wood. Uh, and they were actually at that same World of Commodore uh, trade show. You'll know the products he makes now. They're called Roku, the video game, uh, not video game, but video uh, uh, streaming devices. It's the same guy. And we got a prototype of a digitizer from him that literally made it painless to single step sort of show me the next frame, show me the next frame, click a button, scan it. Uh, and then we had a, back then, what was known as Amiga Interf uh, Interfile Change Format. It was designed by EA. It's sort of the equivalent of JPEG these days. Um, and then all of these thousands and thousands of, of single frames were sent to a fleet of subcontractors who... I paid by the frame because, you know, when the digitizer digitized things, solid areas weren't exactly solid. And to improve the compression, uh, they had to go in and hand touch every single frame so that the compression uh, was able to squeeze things down so that it finally fit onto six 
floppy disks. And out of those six disks, which each held like, I want to say around 800, 900K, the program, the actual Dragon's Lair code that, that ran the whole game was just under 8K wow. bytes. <laughs> Wow. When you mentioned to this this to people, were they kind of skeptical? And when you contacted Don Bluth, like, what was his reaction? And how did you do a deal to make that like an official port? I was at one of these trade shows and had printed out a few colored copies of some of these scans from different scenes in Dragon's Lair um, and met with electronic arts and i won't mention the name of the person because they turned down publishing dragon's lair they weren't uh, interested they had had dozens and dozens and dozens of games on the commodore 64 and also on the amiga but i think they were just in disbelief that, that this would be an actual product and said no we're we're not really interested in that um i've never actually spoken with don bluth or his partners uh i worked with they have an office or at least they did have an office in los angeles uh called sullivan bluth interactive media um and i found this it's sort of like almost like reverse engineering where the, where this laser disc came from it's like the arcade owners whom i purchased the discs from told me oh it was manufactured by this company over here, and then I would follow up with that company, and that led to another company, and eventually it led to Sullivan Bluth Interactive Media. And I said, I'd like to license Dragon's Lair um, for you know a home computer version of it. And they were skeptical, but wide open to it. Uh, and at the time, I don't think they realized that they were... <laughs> They were dealing with somebody who was, relatively speaking, young, 14, 15, 16. And here we are talking about a, a big deal to launch a major product. And that's also when the same David Foster stepped in and we sort of worked together. And it was the very first product uh, the company he formed called ReadySoft uh, launched. So it was quite an adventure to going from getting the disc itself originally to the end where it was actually a, a program that ran on the Amiga. Uh, it was the first time that any game had ever done full screen, full color uh, animation with stereo sound, and it was streaming it live from the floppy disks. There was, you know, there was no other title uh, for years that would stream media live. They were all sort of the, the type where you've got a loading screen and a loading bar and, and please wait for it to load. But uh, with Dragon's Lair, basically it, it starts streaming and then it starts playing the video while it's, you know, pulling in all the rest of the data for what's coming up next. And that was unique for its time. Well, your skills in, you know, achieving that obviously went on to do you well. I mean, you got to work on some very big franchises shortly after as well, including you did the, uh, the NA NES port of Home Alone. Um, obviously, that was a big movie. It was. Um, it's deceptively complicated, both Home Alone and uh, I worked for both titles, Home Alone and Where's Waldo. I worked with another great programmer's name was Paul Coletta. And the technical um, underpinnings of those titles was actually more complex than it looked because the, the NES is a character-based system. What that basically means is just like you've got a font these days, you had a font um, on the NES that you designed, and it was all of the different pieces for the graphics. But I wanted a full screen picture of, you know, the winning screen and the losing screen and, and so on. And there, were, there was not enough space, there were not enough font letters available to do that unless you had multiple fonts and you wrote code that a third of the way down the screen with, a, with what was known back then as a raster interrupt, because the video display raster hits a certain position on the screen, and then your code would switch which font it was using. And of course, as I said, the fonts aren't letters, they're all the pieces of the graphics. 
But both Home Alone and Where's Waldo used this technique so that we could do full screen, high resolution, well, high resolution for the NES, pictures and levels and, and things like that. And most of them were done, oh, six to eight weeks from beginning to end for the whole project. Very, very short time frame. I mean, you know, you're thinking of the, the titles you worked on then, and we mentioned before about what a technical marvel porting Dragon's Lair to the Amiga was. Afterwards, I mean, you kind of did the seemingly impossible. When Doom came out, I mean, you needed a pretty decent PC to run Doom. And I remember the only real console ports that I saw that could run Doom well was stuff like, you know, the Atari Jaguar, these kind of, you know, new super high-end consoles. But you managed to get Doom running on the Super Nintendo, which I can't even imagine how on earth you went about that. Well, thank you. It's, um, uh, I was enamored with Doom because it was the... It was sort of like that big wow moment with Dragon's Lair where, wow, you're playing a cartoon. Well, this was, wow, you're running around in a, in a real world with three-dimensional you know, graphics and, and elevators and platforms and monsters and network play. And it was just amazing. So I actually started doing research into the data formats. And around about that time... Nintendo had a developer conference, and they announced the Super FX. And this was internally, uh, we called it the GSU, and it was a graphics support unit. Uh, and it was a chip designed by Argonaut Software out of the UK, a man named Jez Sands. And the architecture of this chip was basically that it could be added to a Super Nintendo cartridge, and then you had access to this ultra high speed for the time, 21 point something megahertz uh, risk machine that did some incredibly smart things. The way they designed the opcodes, the instruction set, made it incredibly fast and incredibly powerful, but it also had hardware that did conversion from pixel coordinates, you know, X and Y coordinates on the screen, into specific memory addresses. So you could, just like on the old Nintendo, the, the Super Nintendo was character-based. But with the Super FX, you could ignore the fact that it was character-based and just say, here's a bunch of memory that, that I'm going to use to display the data on the screen, and I want you to plot the color red at, at x-coordinate 5 and y-coordinate 22 or something like that. And the hardware did all the calculations necessary to figure out which font glyph to modify to change the color in that particular way. And it sort of struck me that... that wow, there's enough power here to do Doom because the biggest problems of throughput and speed and how to generate high-res graphics for the Super Nintendo um, at a, a minimal cycle time cost were, were all solved by using the Super FX. Um, so you used a, a Star Fox cart kind yes. of to help develop that and your port was incredible as well um having music the full game and you also supported modem and the super scope what made you want to add those extra features actually um yes uh i wanted on the box on the outside of the box for each of the of the super nintendo games there were these little icons that showed oh this one is compatible with the super scope and for example, Doom had the special logo for the Super FX, and I wanted to have the whole box front filled with all of these different little icons. <laughs> so it actually supported the Super Scope. It supported the X-Band. You could play against somebody else online. It supported the, the Super Nintendo mouse. And, of course, it had the Super FX, so it had all of these little icons because I wanted <laughs> I just wanted to do everything possible and fill the box up. Um, and you're right, I did use a Star Fox cartridge. Uh, 
there were no development systems and very little information about the Super FX chip initially. Um, so, uh, so if you sort of opened up a Star Fox cartridge, you could see, oh, here's the extra chip. They called it the Mario chip. And it was something, I forget exactly, like mathematics and rotation integrated something. Uh, but there it sat along with the EEPROM or, or ROM in that particular case. And what happened was uh, through Sculptured Software, a hardware electrical engineer basically made a breadboard, uh, was about the size of half a page of, of paper that had RAM on it. And if you wrote to certain memory locations, it could trigger the RAM to replace the ROM from Star Fox. So effectively, it was a custom cartridge that allowed me to do the development of the software and use the Super FX chip because that was on the cartridge. And it sort of made the Star Fox game itself disappear. And so I wrote a bunch of tools, an assembler and a linker and a debugger um, that were used on a couple of titles. Uh, but that's how I sort of got started. And the Sega Genesis needed A32X to run Doom, so that was definitely one up for Nintendo. Yes, um, it really wanted the game on the Super Nintendo uh, to be faithful, uh, as faithful as possible. There were different trade-offs that were made, but I vaguely think that, I mean, yes, uh, the Super Nintendo has most, but not all of the levels, but it did have more levels than most of the other console ports. And that was largely, I think, because it wasn't really a port. Um, I had started writing a 3D engine after I saw Doom on the PC. And then digging into the technical information that people, various people online had reverse engineered and figured out about the id Doom data formats allowed me to sort of write a tool chain where I can say, you know, here's here's uh, a set of files from the PC version of Doom, convert into the format that my engine uses. And it was a much more compact, tightly compressed uh, set of data formats. And so it allowed me to put in uh, most of the levels and all of the bosses and, and the sound effects and music were actually done by people at uh, Sculptured. It, it was a big project in the end, even though the, the cartridge uh, was only, I want to say, two megs, something like that. Well, when did you get this kind of stroke of genius to run a PlayStation games on the PC? How did that start? I was just thinking one day about what to do next. I have a history of sort of taking on the challenging projects. That's sort of really what drives me. Um, I'm not a very good gamer, um, but if the game has, uh, you know, it's a really big, complex project and there's some technicalities involved, and especially if somebody says, oh, this is impossible, it'll never run on whatever, and sort of kicks my, my curiosity into uh, high gear, and one day... I thought, you know, there's however many hundreds of millions of PCs out there, and this is right at the start of the graphics revolution where 3D graphics cards were coming out, the very first ones, like the Voodoo FX and, and, and so on. And compared to the number of PlayStations out there, it would be great to have this huge library of games from the PlayStation playable on your PC. And so I got a, a PlayStation disc and put it into the CD-ROM drive of, of my PC. And lo and behold, here's a directory, just like, you know, a, a, a listing of all the files and folders. And, and I was kind of surprised. It was totally unencrypted, totally accessible. And I looked and done some research and found out that the main processor was, uh, and I want to say it was a MIPS R3000. And it was like common knowledge that that was the main processor of it. And so I went to an actual bookstore, because back then we had actual bookstores, and bought a MIPS R3000 manual and started looking at some of the files that were on this PlayStation disc 
And sure enough, it was actual code. So it was actually a very easy process. Um, it didn't require any extra work on my part to have the PC be able to access everything that was on the PlayStation disc. Um, and because it was easy, it, it made reverse engineering the entire system possible. If, if there had been uh, uh, you know, encryption or a peculiar format where the PC couldn't read the disks, then it would have been impossible to make Bleem. But, but uh, because they were just standard CDs, um, I don't think anybody expected them to be put into any device other than a, a PlayStation. And so it just magically worked on the PC to access the files. Well, it did seem like magic. You know, when I remember first hearing about it, I was like, really? How, how's that going to work? But then, I mean, you know, the PC, if you had a high-end PC, you could even run these PlayStation games at a high resolution. And you had stuff like hardware acceleration in there as well to make the games even better. Yeah, yeah. Um Basically, Bleem emulates, it was sort of uh, a learn-as-I-go process. Um, I started with the CPU, which I knew, as I said, was a, was a MIPS processor. And so the first thing I did was start implementing the various instructions that, that the MIPS processor supported. But I didn't do it all at once, and I didn't do it alphabetically. I literally did it in the order in which the particular game was using the opcode. So if they had an addition instruction and a comparison and then a subtraction, those were the first three opcodes that I ended up writing. And eventually over time, I ended up sort of filling in all the missing pieces. But once I had figured out the, the vast majority of the CPU opcodes, it allowed me to examine what the game was doing and how the game was generating the graphics. The, basically, the game would sort of access certain areas of memory, and it was one of the custom chips that did all of the 3D mathematics and transformations and drawing polygons. And so the game was, as far as it was concerned, when it wrote to certain areas of memory, it didn't know that that was all being intercepted and then translated into direct 3D polygons for rendering. So if you had a larger monitor and you had a, a 3D graphics card, it would render using the higher capabilities of your PC, and the game had no idea because it was totally transparent to it. It, it was crazy because I remember there was these... Um kind of a few boot discs flying around and uh, there was a few products out there and when bleem came out um uh, well, people must have not kind of believed that it worked was it how hard was it to market actually marketing was really tough but that was <laughs> thankfully that was done by my brilliant bleem partner david herplesheimer um he he and i uh had a bunch of phone calls early, early, early on in Bleem's development. And if you sort of think of it as I did the, the programming and the design and the technical side of things, David did pretty much everything else. The marketing, the sales, he designed the packaging. Um, he even designed the display box where it was this uh, in intricately sort of designed origami folding box where if you assembled it and it was designed for retail stores, you assemble it and it sort of forms like a little display case with all the bleem discs inside of it. Um, marketing was tough, not just in the US, but marketing in Japan and marketing in the UK and marketing in Mexico. And uh, David really did a fantastic job of getting Bleem into stores. Um, I remember uh, the first time we uh, saw Bleem on the shelves at like Best Buy, which is uh, uh, one of the electronics and, and computer chains that is, that's here in the U.S. And, and there was a whole wall and you could immediately spot Bleem because it was a bright yellow box. 
and uh, it was it was really nice to see it. But yeah, marketing was very difficult because of what it was. A lot of people didn't realize that yes, you get this software, and now you can go and play PlayStation games. So it took a while before it sort of caught on, but uh, it eventually did. Well, I mean, we were talking about the Dreamcast when we started our interview earlier. And obviously when that came out, you ported Bleem to the Dreamcast. So we had Bleemcast. And that was the first time I ever remember seeing a commercial emulator for one console that could play games from another. I mean, we mentioned before, it's, it's kind of the equivalent today of having a PlayStation 4 emulator for the Xbox One. So how did you port it to the Dreamcast and why? Actually, this also, one day David said, because we, we would have multiple you know, phone calls and chats and all of, all of that. And one day he said, what do you think about a version of Bleem for the Dreamcast? And I sort of paused for a moment and thought about it. And it's like, hell yes, that would be awesome. So I started to do some research into the, the Dreamcast system, you know, some basic what they call back of the napkin sort of calculations on memory and whether or not the Dreamcast could read a PlayStation disc. Um, there was just a certain set of criteria that had to be met and uh, found out just like when I wrote Bleem for the PC – I found uh, that the main processor for the Dreamcast was a Hitachi SH4. And so I set about writing and t sort of translating, almost porting, the PC version and what it implemented from x86 because most of Bleem was assembly. It wasn't written in C uh, for the PC. And so I translated that into SH4, and uh, while that was all going on, David was working hard to convince Sega that this would be a great coup for them uh, to be able to have their competitors' products running and enhanced, because I, I, at the time I knew the underlying graphics hardware was the imagination technology's power of VR, and I said to David, yeah, the enhancements that we've got on the PC, this on the Dreamcast is going to look a whole other level better because the Dreamcast could output high resolution. It did anti-aliasing. It did all the 3D special effects that are common these days, like even something as simple as transparency and translucency on the Dreamcast. The hardware just did it. It just all worked. But it required a lot of work on David's part to get Sega to to even consider something like this. How did the Microsoft CE and the Mill CD help you? You know, these kind of odd items that were actually on the Dreamcast help with your development and help for the future of homebrew development, actually. Well, as it turns out, um, there was a point at which Sega said, yes, okay, we'll give you, you know, technical specs and so on, but we need to consult with our board in Japan and, and determine whether or not you're going to be able to actually launch the product. But in the meantime, it doesn't hurt anybody if you pursue it as a proof of concept, you know, as, as a potential product. And basically what happened is when Bleem was running – we sort of got some inside information that there was this thing called a mill CD. And David had picked up uh, from Japan, uh, he ordered them, a couple of mill CD discs. And it was a multimedia something or other. I don't remember the exact moniker for it, but it was a regular CD-ROM disc. And it struck me that, okay, if it's able to read the mill CD disc, then it must be possible for us to create a regular CD that isn't Sega's custom GD-ROM format. And the trick was, by that point, we'd received a development kit from Sega. They gave us, you know, a, a, a GD-ROM burner and a Dreamcast development hardware. But the, the, the team who made the development hardware at Sega were, were smart in the sense that they removed the code from the ROM 
in the development kits that supported MIL-CD. So if you reverse engineer the entire ROM, which I did, of the Dreamcast, there was no code that had anything to do with MIL-CD if you were doing it from a development system. Well, I knew that there had to be the code somewhere and it suddenly dawned on me, oh, of course, they've removed the code because they don't want people doing what we're about to do. And so I wrote a tiny little program that we burned onto a GD-ROM because they had loaned us a GD-ROM and a couple of GD-ROM disks. And all it did was take the boot ROM from the commercial version of a Dreamcast and with zip format, zip it and send it out over the serial port. Now, the tricky part was the serial port wasn't a standard like RS-232 serial port. It needed a voltage converter. And I'm a software guy. And it's sort of, that's sort of my wheelhouse. But David built this little tiny box that plugged into the Sega Dreamcast in the back. And on the other end was a regular serial cable. So I could use a terminal program, boot up my special GD-ROM. It dumped the actual uh, Sega system BIOS and boot ROM from the commercial version out to this little contraption serial port thing. And then all of a sudden it became obvious, ah, here's a block of memory that in the development hardware is all blank. It's all empty. But on the production hardware, it's the mil CD format code, how it unscrambles and decodes the mil CD. So I just reverse engineered that. And within a day or so, we had Blimcast booting uh, as a regular CD. And you weren't using any, like, Sega libraries or anything like that. You just kind of diverted all of that stuff. Exactly. Um, we sort of had no choice. We had uh, received low-level, very low-level, like register-level, hardware-level documentation from Sega. We couldn't use their libraries um, because it could imply... Uh, that they were supporting us officially and they didn't want to get into a huge legal battle with certain other companies. And so instead of being able to use the Sega libraries, like, you know, here's something, if you want to draw a polygon, call this function and send down the coordinates and voila, out comes a polygon. I had to write all the low-level implementation of that so we effectively had our own set of libraries that drew polygons and communicated with the sound hardware and, and uh, communicated with the VMU and the little VMU screen. So it was an awful lot of work, uh, but it, it sort of kept Sega in the clear because we weren't on a GD-ROM. We weren't supported by Sega. We were manufacturing the disks ourselves at a, a standard CD um, printing plant. Uh, and where the little uh, logo appeared, we could customize it. And so David wrote this text that, so when you boot the game in the right hand lower quadrant of the screen, it's uh, because the screen says, you know, Sega Enterprises, copyright, whatever, and, and the little box appears with a, a red arrow that points up that says, ignore this. <laughs> this is actually unrelated and has nothing to do with Sega or Sega Enterprises and blah, 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 just to protect Sega so they could turn around and say, look, these guys are an independent company, and yes, we've given them access to hardware specs and so on, but we're not we're not sanctioning what they're doing. Although at uh, E3 uh, years and years ago, when Bleemcast was first shown at Sega's uh, major press event, they uh, had mentioned Bleemcast and the whole crowd erupted in cheers and, <laughs> and kudos. And it was amazing. It was, uh, it was just amazing because, yes, you're absolutely right. It was the very first time that, that one platform could play another platforms in, in the console genre. You know, there had been emulation between PlayStation and PC, 
but never between competing consoles. Um, and it sort of opened the door to legalize emulation and legalize comparative screenshots and a whole bunch of other things that, that nowadays emulation is common. Well, we'll go into the legal stuff in a second, but um, when Bleenclast was actually released, um, I I initially heard that it was meant to be a kind of disc that would be able to do all PlayStation titles, that you'd you'd put your Bleemcast in and then your PlayStation title, but it ended up getting released for games such as Metal Gear Solid, I think there was um, Gran Turismo and stuff, Tekken, yeah, separate titles. How was it? Uh, how did that happen? It was a balance. The PlayStation had a had a library of hundreds of titles, but because of the way Bleem emulates things, um, it's not a cycle accurate, you know, perfect um, representation of the PlayStation hardware. That choice uh, to do it where it was sort of a um, learn what the game is doing and then do it better, sort of, you know, oh, the game is drawing polygons, I'm going to draw them differently, and I'm going to do it in high resolution, versus it's drawing a polygon, and it's exactly these pixels. The, the, the net effect was that uh, it made it possible for us to enhance the specific games to a much greater level than if we had chosen to support more titles. Um, The titles were starting to really push the PlayStation hardware, and so each of the individual Bleemcast discs are actually different programs. The the vast majority of the code is the same. You know, the the core CPU emulation and so on, but each of the, the different games pushed the hardware, the PlayStation hardware, at a low level in unique ways that sometimes were incompatible with one another. So we chose titles that we thought were were representative of of the highest level of quality um, on the PlayStation, and it happened to be Gran Turismo 2 and uh, Tekken 3, and Metal Gear Solid, sort of three different genres of games uh, and the top level of quality for those games. And so I went in and then customized all the extra enhancements. So for certain sequences, like Metal Gear Solid is, is sort of a whole bunch of mini games that are, that are in some ways different, uh, but share sort of a common storyline. Uh, they might use certain tricks with the... PlayStation hardware that had to be emulated differently at different times. And so the PlayStation uh, game, in order to make it look enhanced throughout the entire experience on the Dreamcast, it knew when you were in, you know, the, the stealth mode where you have to avoid uh, the, the soldiers seeing you or where you were outside and you could hear the wolves. Those were done uh, using very different techniques on the PlayStation. Uh, and so Dream, the Dreamcast version of Bleem also did customization for each of those titles. And, and the net result, I think, was that the titles looked so much better than had we chosen to go the opposite route, which was basically, let's try and emulate this thing cycle accurate. But then, you know, why not just go buy a, a PlayStation uh, if you want to see the exact same level of graphics as opposed to the enhancements. Well, the fact that you did enhance the games and, you know, you were, you were giving Dreamcast owners essentially access to exclusive PlayStation titles, that did really get on um, Sony's radar eventually. So when did that happen? And um, you, you went to court. How did you fight them in court? And what kind of precedents did that court case set? They actually tried uh, to get an injunction. As soon as Bleem on the PC, our website put up, we're taking pre-orders. As soon as that happened, uh, we received the lawsuit. There were two people who worked at Bleem, uh, John Hangartner and Scott Carroll, both of them attorneys. uh, And, of course, David, uh, David Herpelsheimer, who really sort of Um, acted as an excellent bridge between myself on the technical side and the attorneys. 
And we sort of fought it and said, look, we're not using anything from you guys. We think that it's a great product because the games, which is where companies, video game companies make their money. It's the razor. It's called the razor and blades model where the razor itself is cheap, but the blades cost a lot. And the blades in this case are the games and they're licensed. And by making the PC play PlayStation games, it opens up their market to the hundreds of millions of PC users out there that they wouldn't have access to before. And it costs them nothing. Well, they ended up uh, suing us on a number of different levels, but the net result was the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that uh, emulation is legal and comparative screenshots where if you look at the Bleedcast uh, or the Bleem packaging, we've got a screenshot from the PlayStation and we've got beside it the screenshot running from Bleem showing, hey, here's you know, the game and how much better it looks. And the judges ruled that this is legal and it is allowed, even though the, the, the screenshots were copyright inherently by whoever it is that wrote the game, like Konami with Metal Gear Solid, for example, this provides the public with a way of doing comparative shopping effectively. It's like, if you can't compare one product against another, that that's sort of bad for the, the public interest. And so that was decided that comparative screenshots were in fact legal. It's uh, the, the legal precedents that Bleem helped set are, are probably among my uh, career's greatest achievements that I'm, I'm most uh, pleased about because now you see emulation everywhere. You see it on Nintendo, you see it on Xbox. It's, uh, it's everywhere. It's commonplace. And, you know, 20 years ago, uh, it was rare. Well, recently I've noticed, you know, obviously we had the, the PlayStation Classic and the little mini console. There's been a little mod tool for that where people can install their own games called Bleem Sync. Is that anything yes. to do with you? <laughs> no, that has, I'm, I'm flattered by the, the choice of name, frankly, uh, but that has nothing to, do, uh, nothing to do with me at all. But it is interesting that it shows that emulation is, is everywhere now. Uh, even in in Sony's own own products, because of the value and and the potential benefit to consumers, emulation. Twenty years from now, how are we going to preserve uh, the history of video games and the technology? Eventually, the hardware is just going to stop working. It's not like a record player where there's a needle and a pickup, and it's relatively inexpensive. Twenty more years from now, Dreamcast hardware is going to be that much more difficult to obtain. And unless emulation or some other technology is developed, we'll never be able to play Shenmue or, or Crazy Taxi or any of those classics um, that are on the Dreamcast. And the same thing applies to you know any particular console. So I think that, that emulation itself is important. Um, and it's clear that all of the big companies have reluctantly agreed that, yeah, back compat and emulation are things that customers want. And the fact that people are still reverse engineering and making things compatible with more systems, I think is a good thing, frankly. Well, for our kind of final question, um, I can't believe that they're still creating uh, Dreamcast kind of homebrews using the mill cd technology and uh, there's a great group called josh prod that are currently producing quite a lot um we were talking earlier when you were saying you, you might have some development documentation and stuff that you're going to release on the um dreamcast hardware yeah i've got uh i've got a whole i mean my as i said my career is is now 36 37 years and so i've got original technical manuals from Commodore about the Commodore 64 and I've got all the low level manuals for the Dreamcast and the hardware and some of it is very complex and it's doing nobody any good in a storage locker. Oh, everything that we develop uh, collectively uh, 
we stand on the shoulders of giants. It, it's based on everything that's come before us. And if you don't have that preserved, it, it I think, will be lost. And so I'm actually going to end up donating all of that stuff to uh, one of the museums that's out there uh, called the, the uh, Video Game Project. And uh, they're run by... Uh, a guy named Alan Binley, who's a, a game and retro gaming fanatic. Uh, and uh, I'm going to send a, a huge old box of stuff. I recently came across some of my old Dreamcast notes and a little handwritten uh, reverse engineering of the BIOS and, and stuff like that that uh, I think is important um, to get into people's hands because until there's a really full-featured, fully operational Dreamcast emulator, it's a system that remains in jeopardy. Um, and by that, I mean jeopardy of losing all of that rich history because nowadays, Sega, they're a software company. That They used to be a hardware company. They used to be a very successful, like with the Genesis, a very successful hardware company. I think that it's important for us to... Uh, in the video game industry, remember our roots. Um, and and uh, so that's why I'm going to donate all of that uh, stuff. That's incredible. Well, Randy, we could honestly probably do like another 10 episodes with you, the, yeah. the amount of incredible things you've worked on. I mean, thank you so much for coming on and having that little trip down memory lane with us. It's been wonderful getting your stories. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor for uh, me to be on, on the program. And anytime you want to call back, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> Sound. Got faces to go, gotta follow my way.